Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, How to Gain Smart and Efficient International Market Intelligence. Thank you for joining us this morning. In a moment, I'll introduce our first speaker today, Victoria Balderson from Bolts Global, and she'll take you through today's presentation. If you would like to go over the slides, all these are available in the handouts tab on your control panel on the right-hand side. And if you have any questions that you'd like to submit throughout, you can type these into the questions pane and we will try and address as many as those we can do at the end of the presentation. Just before I pass over to Victoria, I'd like to take a quick poll question just to see who we've got online today. And it'll come up on screen, it's quite a simple question of do you currently export, yes or no? And we'll leave this on screen as people vote. There we go with the majority of voters. I'll close that now. And then share the results with you. As you can see, 71% are currently exporting and 29% aren't. Which is positive to see so many exporters already. Um, and hopefully the presentation will be useful for both audiences and you'll have something to take away from it. It's now my pleasure to pass over to Victoria. Thanks very much, Dan. I'm going to just put the webcam on so that you can see me. So, fantastic. Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to this webinar this morning. I'm really happy to be presenting this um, webinar on market intelligence on behalf of DIT Yorkshire. So what I'm going to take you through today is um, a variety of, of hints, tips, and advice um, on how you can gain very smart and efficient um, market insight for your chosen target export market. I'd like to leave 15 minutes um, at the end, more or less, for, que for questions, and I do hope that you have plenty of them um, that we can address. So in terms of objectives for the session, what I'm wanting to do really, like I say, is to, to give you some real practical tips and advice on, on understanding how to gain the right information and the most efficient information for your target international market. Um, and these, these will be ways in which you can hopefully you know, save plenty of time and money um, in doing so as well. So before we start, I just want, before I get into the actual presentation, I just wanted to give you a bit of detail about, about me, I guess, my background and, and Bols Global, my business. So, just to give you a bit of context, I've, um, I'm originally a linguist, um, but I've all, and I've always worked internationally for, for all of my career, working for uh, companies from startups to SMEs um, in a variety of different sectors over the years, helping to build export um, sales and helping on the sales and marketing side predominantly. So um, from that, and as of last year, I then created uh, my business, Bolts Global, and, and what we do is we help the SMEs, the small businesses, and the startups with international marketing and, and business development, and really trying to find ways, having been through it myself, working for companies, helping to find ways in which you can um, achieve more with less, because let's face it, we're all very sort of resource-stricken, um, and how can we help companies to achieve more internationally? Um, without as much resource as some of the larger organizations have. So as a business, uh, Bolts Global, we, we specialize in specific sectors um, that adds more value for our clients that we work with. So we, we focus on um, UK brands and companies within the health, food and drink, the supplement and the medical devices sector. So um, let's get into the presentation then. I think one of the things when I was thinking about this was re with regards to, um, you know, these days when we're talking about gaining information and, and doing research for international markets, actually, um, it really should be in some respects a lot easier these days because we have so much information at our fingertips digitally um, that we can access. But actually, it's very easy to get bogged down in a lot of that data. Um, and actually, 
they can be, you can spend far too much time sometimes looking at published reports, spending money on doing, you know, quite extensive research. Um, but I know from my own experiences and working with clients that in the SME environment, you know, you don't have the luxury of being able to afford some of the quite expensive reports that are available, as well as having the time or necessarily your own, you know, your own knowledge in-house. Um, to be able to gain that insight. So, you know, it's all about getting enough information, but also then getting the cash in the tills and growing the business and, and getting the sales ultimately. So it, it's about getting a balance, I think, between knowing enough information to make some informed decisions and then, you know, going for it really and, and learning as you go along. Um, and, and that's kind of been a key to the way I've learned as I've gone along and the support I give to clients, you know, we, we, we need to get a set amount of relevant data, enough data to make the decisions and then to start going in and developing our knowledge within those markets um, and learning as we go along. What I also wanted to say as well was um, when it comes to talking about market intelligence, and I think, um, you know, like I say, there's a lot of research available that you can undertake, a lot of reports that you can undertake, but also to gain the intelligence aspect, you also need to have the analysis part of, of that as well. So you need to be able to look at the information that you've gathered and analyze it relevant to your business and what you're trying to achieve. Um, and that comes from looking at the relevant data, finding out what's relevant for you, and how that information will then inform your international strategy and your plan forward. Um, so you need to always be analysing the data that you've got, making sure is this relevant, is this going to help me make some decisions with regards to how we approach that market and how we go about um, finding the right customers and the right routes to market and the right entry. Um, and I think another thing I would say is focus, <laughs> focusing down um, on some key areas and key markets is really important as well because it's very easy you know, we've got the world to go at and it's very easy for you to say, well, we'll look at this and this and this and this. But again, often you don't have a huge amount of resource, so it's about actually focusing in on those key markets that you want to develop further because the intelligence is, is an ongoing and can be quite a long process. So you, have, you won't have the resource and you risk stretching yourself too thin, trying to look at too many markets at once. So I think once you've had some basic insight that you've developed, you then need to drill down and have a focus on the markets that you believe are going to give you the best potential opportunities for your product or service. I think as well with regards to this, I'm talking more from an aspect that you've actually decided on which markets you want to focus on. Um, market selection in itself is another area where, again, there's a lot of um, ways in which you need to look at that. I'm coming at this today from an, uh, an aspect that you've got a feeling of which already which markets you're going to focus in on and which ones you've selected um, to then gain further intelligence and insight on. Um, so that's kind of the basis of, of what we're working on today. So in terms of how we work um, and we work with clients as well, we've developed um, what we call the BGC matrix, um, not to be confused with the BCG, which if anybody's done business, um, you know, any business kind of knowledge, it's, it's the Bolsk Global C matrix. So what we've looked at are the key areas that when you are gaining market intelligence, that you need to look at those different areas um, to gain the right insight in, the, in, in that particular market. So you can see there we've got um, six key areas that we look at, and I'll take you through each of those um, during this presentation. So obviously looking at the target customers that you're going to be um, looking for and how you can gain some insight on those. Collaborators as well, as well as competitors that are in the marketplace. Not forgetting the costings and pricing is another key issue um, that I think a lot of companies struggle with. Um, knowing how to price your products in, in a market and how to actually gain some insight with those as well. What's right for you and what's right for the market um, is important. Customs insofar as there are regulatory um, and registration requirements for many products um, 
and so how do you navigate and, and gain some in understanding that can then inform how you can go about entering that market and what the requirements will be from your side um, as, as, as a producer or a service provider. And the culture as well, the culture within that market um, is again another, another contributing factor to allowing you to see and gain the right market intelligence as well. Now with that, um, that's all kind of combined with, um, I've put at the bottom, the two, um, well the bottom and the, the top of the slide, two different aspects. Curiosity I think is a key part of this and I think it's about um, going at gaining, the, gaining intelligence with a very kind of open mind and with that I mean not necessarily using your own um, reference points and how things work in the UK market. It's really about going out there with a, with almost a blank a blank sheet of paper and say and being curious to find out how things are working in that market, asking lots of questions, not expecting anything to be like it is in the way you've ever done business before in the UK or in any other export markets that you're currently selling to. If you're looking at a new market, go at it afresh and be curious and ask questions around all of these areas and more. Um, as well as seeing this, like I said, as an ongoing process. So you're continuously collecting data and, and information and, and weeding out what's relevant for you to formulate your plans and cultivate all of that information as you're going along. And it's an iterative process um, that will take time, but with some of the right questions and, and approaching it in the right way, um, you can gain some really good insights, um, sometimes fairly quickly as well. So I'll take you through the, the, these six areas and, um, and and sort of give you some ideas of how we go about um, looking at, at these areas in more detail when we are doing and gaining market intelligence for clients and with them. So if we start with the customer side of things, um, I mean this is again another area that we've looked at and we talk about the Bulls Global sort of GB approach and then go backwards, we're flipping it. Um, there you can see it's a very this is a very simplistic and it's not you need to do this for each of your own individual companies but looking at the route to market um, within your target your target territory so this one is just a very simplistic one whereby you know you you would be the manufacturer potentially in the UK say and you're selling you're selling a pro, a retail a consumer product that would go either via potentially an agent a distributor to sell to a retailer in that market um, who would then obviously sell on to the end consumer. And obviously when you're thinking about who your customers are, then you would be looking at finding those partners um, in that market, for example. So you're looking for you're actively looking for a distributor. So you, you know, a lot of companies will focus their efforts on finding those distributors and finding the right partners. Um, but actually, there's a lot to be said about reverse engineering it and trying to go further down the channel, uh, down the chain to find people at the other end. So you'd be looking at the consumer side or even going to the retailers to then allow you to find the people further further back um, and, and sort of join up the dots, if you like. So, um, you know, speaking to, to consumers, I mean, it's not always that easy to do but I mean just to give you an example of something I've done in, in the past when I was out in Cambodia working on some sports nutrition products actually um, part of the insight was going obviously into the retail stores um, and gaining insight seeing what was on the shelves and um, seeing the brands that were there the pricing that was available but actually I also was asking a few consumers that were coming in and out of the shop and actually saying, well, what have you bought, what brands are you buying, why, um, and actually gaining some feedback that way. It's not always possible, but it's just about thinking of ways that you can gain some insight. That obviously being an example of being out in market where you can actually inform some decisions. The same with the retailer aspect. Um, I've just come back from Dubai uh, for a client and they deal a lot with um, one of the major retailers here in the UK um, who also have a presence out, out in the Gulf and the GCC. So part of the strategy that, that we looked at was actually approaching that retailer also um, as an existing customer and saying, well, actually, out there we also want, we're looking at expanding. You know, how could we go about doing this 
in that part of the world and that you know if you have a good relationship with those people in the UK and, and have a look and see are there do they have an international scope could you reach out to them and, and that retailer then gave us plenty of information and said yeah here's the contact details and then we could work backwards and they wanted to deal with the distributor so again we were saying okay you don't want to deal with us direct like we do in the UK that's fine um, who do you deal with then? Who are the distributors in your market um, that you would recommend for us? And then being able to do that allowed us to find some suitable partners that, that we're now talking to and, and hopefully going to do a deal with. So what I would say is with that, you know, map out your route to market. Um, it will be different for every sector. And I know I appreciate there'll be people listening from all sorts of different areas. So map out your channels, your route to market, and see, you know, how it could work for you. And actually, is there an opportunity that you could somehow reach some of those other groups um, in that chain to gain insight that would allow you to ultimately enter the market and start start selling your product as well and gaining some insights. So, as well as customers, um, another key area is is actually collaborators. Um, and I think this is something that a lot of companies can forget about sometimes, you know, they're very keen to sell to people, find customers, but actually there's a lot to be said about creating a network of collaborators with with whom you can actually have, um, you know, can lead you to other customers, other buyers, market information that you wouldn't have necessarily gained from just directly approaching customers. So, again, I would look at that and, you know, a basic stakeholder mapping tool is quite useful. Um, and looking beyond, like I said, just your customers. So, for example, um, within your own network, there may be people within your industry um, who are exporting into a target market. They have a, a complementary um, portfolio of products, so there's no conflict, and they'd be quite happy to potentially share some market insight with you that they've gained from being in that market um, or attending you know, a trade fair there, exhibiting there even. Um, they can give you some information that could be really useful. Other people within that market that you're looking at that maybe wouldn't be a customer but could support you. Um, so just to kind of give you an example, out, out in Dubai, I, um, as part of what a project, we, we, we did an exhibition stand for, it, for it with, some, with a client and actually what happened was we needed to then publish some marketing materials in the marketplace. So, you know, you're building network of people that can support you with marketing materials, helping you with the stand, et cetera, et cetera. But actually, the person that helps on the marketing materials also sells, has as one of their customers quite a large um, uh, travel um, company that actually further down the line became of interest to one of, one of my other clients. So through actually that relationship, I'm then able to access for a client some, some customer contacts, which you wouldn't have necessarily thought, well, this is a somebody that works on it, on, on providing marketing materials, but you just don't know. And as you build those relationships with people, you can get insight through lots of different ways. Um, so, so see people as potential collaborators, cultivate your network, build it um, continuously, and, and, and that can be really, really valuable um, to you as, as you're moving forward in your different target markets. Obviously, another area to look at quite importantly is your competition um, that, that exists within that market, and that is both local and international. You know, don't forget that there may be some local competition in the market that, whilst it may not be from a product point of view as, as high quality, um, but if it's fit for purpose and it's been, been around for a long time, there's some brand recognition, that could be quite a significant competitor for you. Um, that you need to, to be aware of. So I always find uh, that the Porter's Five Forces is a great way and a good model to be able to an analyze the opportunities for you in that market. So looking at um, how, many, how many brands and, and competing products exist in the marketplace already. So again, it's looking at how, how, what's the supply and demand. Um, you know, sometimes it can be great that you find that there's the there's a high demand from customers, but very low supply or very few brands out there, and it's a clear opportunity um, for you to put extra resource into that market and and you know look to try and enter it as soon as possible. At the same time, it may be the opposite way around. It may be a crowded market. So again, that comes down to 
does it make it viable for you? Um, and, and what's your proposition? How are you going to be different then from everyone else that's out there um, in the marketplace at the moment? Can you be different? Can you have a different selling point that will work in that market? Another thing to think about is um, are there going to be other brands that will follow you? Are there, will there be, you know, you might enter the market that may feel that it's quite an open, open at the moment for you, but potentially will other people follow once they start to see, you, see some success that you're gaining? Um, and being aware of that. Another area is, is threat of substitute products. So, for example, um, you know, if I think of a food product that maybe isn't particularly healthy, um, then you may then feel it may not be a direct competing product, um, but there may be then a threat of perhaps substituting with a healthier type of I think for a snack, for example, um, that you wouldn't necessarily necessarily see as a direct competing product, but it could still potentially um, cannibalize or eat, in, eat into your sales that you're trying to gain into that marketplace as well. So be aware of that and, and look at what's out there from a, from a competition point of view um, as well. Pricing and, and costings are again another area that I think um, I see a lot of challenges with, for companies. So when you're trying to understand the marketplace, it's, it's looking at actually what brands are already there at the moment, as I've already said on the competition side, where do they come from? Um, are they local or international? What's their value proposition versus your own that you're trying to achieve in that marketplace? And I think as well, remember that it's not necessarily the way that you sell in the UK doesn't have to be the same as how you do that in um, overseas. And actually, you can change your offering. Um, in certain parts of the world, certainly be, having a British product does add a lot of value and it might not be something that you necessarily talk about in too much detail within the UK market, but actually when you go overseas, you might need to turn up the fact that you, you're selling this British product, it's got the quality stamp. Um, that can be a real good selling point that you might need to tweak you know, how you position the product and your proposition as such. So. Um, and that comes from looking at what's already out there and, and how you can be different within within a category um, that you're working with. Also, um, when it comes to obviously taking your products overseas, there are extra costs um, when it comes to setting your pricing. So you need to then think and consider that through. Um, and that comes from the types of pricing that you're offering and, and what terms that is as well. You know, some is it just a case if it's X works, you know, come and pick the products up from my warehouse, or are you are you transporting the transporting those products to, to, to your customer? There's a cost there from that aspect. The export documentations that you might need. Um, again, you can when you start talking to people in the market, these are questions that you can start asking straight away in terms of you know documentation that's required that can be another cost um, that you need to consider, um, as well as you know, labeling on a product, for example, um, or does it need to be in local languages? Does it need to be you know, translated into local languages? Again, that's going to be another cost, another potentially, from a product point of view, a manual labor cost that maybe needs factoring in um, and being aware of. And these are things that you can ask quite quite early on when you start talking to, to potential um, stakeholders and customers. And it's it, I would advise you to start talking to them as early as possible about these kind of extra costs when you're starting to formulate your strategy and talk about pricing and um, being aware of those, factoring those in and you know, ask, just asking, you know, are we going to have to translate the packaging? Are we going to have to change the way that the product is at the moment? If so, how? You know, the more you can ask um, as early on in the process as possible, the better. I appreciate that sometimes people want costs and prices before anything else, uh, but if you can try and ask and at least gain some insight before you start giving away your pricing. Um, then, then do do that because um, obviously it will help you to factor in and be able to then, you know, hopefully get a, a good, good profit margin on on, uh, on your products as well. So then that will then formulate your pricing strategy that, that you adopt. So do think that through and get talking to people as, as you know for as quickly as possible, really on that on that aspect. Um, another area that I, that I mentioned was customs. Now, what I mean by that is insofar as I call the three R's, so the regulations in a market, the registration requirements for your 
for what you're offering and any restrictions that may cause you problems because you know again to find out that information as quickly as you can is useful now you can use a number of areas to find that out anybody that you engaged with that's interested in your products if they are used to importing products they will understand um, certainly from a documentation and registration point of view what's required um, and you need to make sure that you can adhere to those registration requirements and if you can't is there a way that you can find a way to do so uh, what documentation is needed register a product. Um, restrictions, there may be some restrictions on um, in certain markets, I don't know, on, on the ingredients that you use in a product, um, on any of the components, any of the raw materials. Um, so again, being able to present that and ask, ask the questions, are there any restrictions to any of the stakeholders that you start to engage with. That could be going, like I said, to any of your collaborators, customers approaching sometimes the relevant authorities there. Um, as well as any of the embassies um, that are out there in market and obviously using um, the DIT network and your advisors who can put you in touch with people in those markets as well. So it is an area that not everybody thinks about but it's a, it's a key one because this, this can be, you know, we talk about, I don't like talking about barriers as such because I don't think it's about challenges but, but this in particular, this area could be the one that may cause you some real issues and, and maybe with some of that insight, with the gaining that intelligence, you might then decide it's not actually the right market to continue focusing on because some of the registrations and restrictions are too onerous for you right now. So um, it is a key one to look at as early as you can when you start gaining intelligence. The last area to talk about um, with regards to the matrix anyway is culture and, and what I mean by that is I'm not talking about you know business etiquette, how you hand over business cards, you know, the ability to speak speak the foreign language um, out in market. They are all really useful to help you as, as you as you are obviously entering markets. But it's it's it goes beyond that. What, what I mean when I'm talking about it from a market intelligence point of view is actually given the culture in the marketplace, does your product have a place there? Um, and it's about how your culture will impact your marketing and your marketing strategy. So that is, for example, the values and beliefs in that marketplace means that, you know, for example, if you have um, a product that, you know, I'm thinking again, I guess food from my background, um, that has any 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 pork you know, any pork product related products or ingredients. Um, culturally in, in, in Muslim countries, that's going to be a very, very difficult product to try and enter with. And so um, because of their beliefs and, and their values that they have. So actually, is the, you know, it's about understanding that and, and how, how, how attitudes are within the market to say, actually, is there a place for my product as a result of that? It's not just about how you do business and you know, understanding the marketplace. It's about how do, they, how do the, potential, the potential people buying my product, the consumers in that marketplace, um, going to react to my product. Also, again, that comes down to, and I always find it quite interesting to, um, to, to you know, take your products out to market or show them, um, you know, show the branding and the packaging and 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 how, you know, the way that that's perceived in 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 the UK market versus how people will perceive a product um, locally. Quite interesting when I've had feedback on the packaging, the colours, the branding. You know, sometimes we think it looks great for our for. for the markets we sell into and then you take it and you ask it direct feedback from either distributors or end consumers and it can be really quite interesting that, the, that they have a completely different take and view on that product is it does it is it a premium would you buy it where do you think it comes from what do you like about it what don't you like about it it can be um it can be quite interesting um so it, it culture in that aspect and, and that's what i mean about always asking questions um, and gaining that, that insight as far as possible. So I guess then really another another aspect of the presentation that I wanted to talk you through aside from that the matrix that, that we use and the elements to look at is to how to kind of you know do more with less. Um, like I say, I, 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 I know that a lot of companies don't have a lot of resource um, or time or money. So how can you then do all of that that we've just talked about? with not a lot, let's be honest. So, but there's 
you know, I've, I've done this many times with lots of different companies, so how do you do this? So, a number of ways, and a lot of them are listed there. So, first thing I would say is, see what you've already got at your fingertips um, when it comes to your own networks, and, and leverage those as far as you possibly can. So, that might be personal networks. If you've got in mind a target market and you know somebody that's living out there through your own network, um, engage with them, find out how they could potentially help you gain some insight as well. Um, professional networks, again, through the sectors and the industries where you work. Do, are there other people that have experiences there that are, you know, most people in my, you know, from what I've seen are very, very kind of willing to share experiences and, and you know, support and collaborate with each other as far as possible. So if you've got your, within your sectors networks, again, trade associations, you're a member of an organization, and there are people there that could give you some insight, um, potentially give you some contact, give you something to start with. Ask the questions, engage with them, reach out to them, and, and I've found that most people are quite willing and happy to do that um, and support each other. And I see it a lot when I when I do the, the, the trade shows that you know on the stands the exhibitors um, are quite keen to support each other. We're all on generally British pavilions a lot of the time and. You know, it's really it's really nice to see and, and, and tap into that as far as you possibly can. Um, as well as, like I've said, any events that are going on in trade associations that are available. Obviously, as well, DIT are there to support um, to support companies. You, you, you can have your own advisor um, and engage with them as far as possible. Ask them to help you. You know, most most of the advisors are great at putting you in contact with various people, various embassies and the chambers overseas. Use that network, you know, use it, ask the questions. That's what they're there for. Um, I've found that they can be very useful um, in giving you potential contact, potential market information. As a starting point, they are great to give you some insight as to where to go from there and um, use, use that resource. That's what they're there for. Um, as far as you possibly can. I think another area that people don't use as much but is very powerful is you know, use the technology that's available at the moment. So LinkedIn is great for certain industries in getting to um, certain people when you're targeting specific customers. It does depend from market to market um, how, again, culturally in tune they are with LinkedIn and, and how it works, but I've found it to be fantastic in getting to the right people when it comes to trying to business develop because whilst you may have to go through the traditional gatekeeping and try and find the relevant person, most LinkedIn accounts are managed by that that person, that decision maker. Not you're not having to go through gatekeepers to get to that person. And um, you know, if you if you can create a powerful and this is not about having a premium paying a premium service for LinkedIn, it's about having a powerful introductory um, invitation um, message and getting them to then connect uh, with you and then ask the relevant questions. Are they the right decision maker? Could they give me give you some insight into a specific thing that you're asking for? Um, use it. I found it really really helpful um, for for clients and for getting into various markets. Skype's another thing that you know I think is great to be able to build relationships as well as a, as a tool the face-to-face -face element that you get um, and building relationships before you've even gone out to market is a great way of, of starting that relationship building with, with potential, um, potential customers, collaborators and other people in market. Another area that I've used in the past which I found has been really helpful is engaging with local universities and students to get some support, again, to get some extra help on, on what you're looking at. So. Um, a lot of the local universities have um, projects uh, whereby they are actively wanting the students to work with um, partners and you know industries to give them some practical experience in in understanding how to find new markets, undertake some market research. So they can be a great resource, and often it's a case of you know just giving up some of your time, giving them a brief, and you know, asking them to go off and do a project for you. So they could they could give you some initial insight into a market that you could then take further. Um, I've done that in the past with, for example, we did a project for the Indian market a few years ago and the students did a fantastic job of looking and analysing that market for us and getting us so far along the line 
I then picked up off the back of that um, that that report, which was completely free, apart from like I say, just putting a brief together and giving up some of my time to engage with the students. Took that report further by then going out into market, um, combined it with some extra market research, and did a visit. We you know we undertook a visit and went out, and we met with some of the people that they'd signed posters to um, initially, and, and using some of that data. So. Have a look locally if there's any support that the university can offer you. If you've got a particular project you want to look at, that can be really helpful and, and very kind of um, cost effective as well uh, with some bright students. Some of them are international. There's then sometimes the opportunity to lead on to internships um, or to offer some extra, extra work off the back of that, which again is something that, that I've done um, for certain students as well. Another one is, is leveraging funding streams. Um, obviously, it's a case of looking at what's available locally. I know from a certainly from the IT perspective, it's all regionally based. So it's it's understanding um, if there are some pots of money around that can support you in what you're trying to do with gaining your market intelligence. Now that could be desk based or going out into market. Um, look what's around. I, I know certainly in the Yorkshire region at the moment, um, there is money available. There's a market, depending on which market you visit, there's potential small grants to help support with that, as well as certainly in this region at the moment there's some ERDF funding available linked to job creation, but there is some, some funds available there that you can tap into. So again, ask your local DIT um, advisor if you, if you have one, what's available, and, and also speak to other people in your network that are working internationally, they may know of some other, other pots of money and funding that's available to support you as well. And the last thing I think, and I've got another slide on this, is, is trade missions or getting out into market. They, they can be really valuable as a way of understanding the marketplace. Um, they may be a program that's put together, um, or it may be one that you, you um, sort of create yourself. But going out and, and within your industry looking and following on, um, you know, on a program can be a really great way to get some insight and it's not necessarily, again, there can be some funding available for that, but it's also what you can gain on, on the sector as well as the people that you meet there as well, the people you meet on that on that mission that are, again, future contacts in a network that you're building that you can share information with as well, and they can be really valuable at, in the space of a few days, finding out a heck of a lot of information um, through that as well. So just to give you some of the free export resources available, and I'm sure most of you will probably know some of these. These are just the very basic ones that are around. Obviously, DIT have got their own website where there's a lot of information on there that you can gain from a top-line basis. Again, they've, got, they've launched a Find the Buyer service, so you can try and actually find, when it comes to customers, some potential buyers there through the opportunities that are around there. Open to Export is another, again, government-led um, portal, I guess, and, and that, again, has lots of information on there as well. One of the things they do offer is an export plan that you can download a template and work through, so that helps you to sort of strategize and put your planning in place for the markets you're looking at and asking you to understand you know, why, why you look at those markets, what, what, how are you going to put the resource in, etc. Chambers of Commerce, again, can be a good area that can give you some insight, contacts as well. The British Libraries um, is, are places up and down the country where you can actually go in and access some of those expensive market reports that you wouldn't, you know, that are normally chargeable if you were just, you know, to buy it on the internet. But you can go into the, you have to go into the libraries, but you can access some of those market reports for free. So depending on your sector and what, what information you're looking for, that's worth also considering and um, been able to help you gain some, some market information as well. Uh, last couple of slides and then I'm going to open it up for questions. But I think, again, one of the things I wanted to say with the, with, with the presentation was actually, as much as you can do the desk research, um, you really can't be being out there in the field and, and getting out there and speaking to people. Um, so I would encourage everyone that once you've got some basic top line information to really then get out into that market and start asking those questions. Meet all the different stakeholders and people that you could speak to to gain some insight. So like I say, it would be collaborators, customers, any trade associations out there, any regulatory people out there, anybody that can, can actually help you answer some of the questions that you have, um, which I would say 
that comes to planning a visit beforehand um, and knowing your key objectives and what, what information you need to gain um, on that visit and how you're going to go about and who are the people that could potentially give you that information. So it's about planning your visit. And I would say always look if there's an opportunity when there's a trade fair happening in that market or there's another event that's going on and try and coincide what your visit with that because then not only are you going to potentially go and meet various people but if there's a bit of a hub and there's, there's a lot of activity and people are coming in for a trade fair or an event, again there's more people there that you can obviously leverage some opportunities to talk to lots of people and actually go and see those trade fairs yourself or that event, attend it. It might be something you might think, okay, further down the line, then we might actually have a presence there. Um, it could be a bit of a, a good scoping exercise as well. Um, and like I say, then you see if there's any grants or funding available to help support with any of the field research that you're going to do. Oh, one thing I did want to mention was Open to Export are also running um, a competition that they're running throughout the year, and it's related to the export plan. So actually, um, it's, um, I, think the, I think the next one closes tomorrow actually, but they've run them periodically and there's an opportunity to win some, some money to support your export plans as well. So if you haven't heard of that, do check it out on the website um, and find out more and see if you would want to apply next time round for some, you know, some sums of money and some support that's given, um, given to, to, to winners or runners of, of, of the competition if they've got a solid export plan. Um, as well, and then using your tools, Sky Scanner for, for flight Airbnb as well can be great ways of being able to get out to market in a really cost-effective way. Um, I, I went recently to Paris in October. Um, I managed to get there and be at a trade fair and have meetings for less than five hundred pounds. Um, because why? Because I looked at the op opportunities, the options, and used Airbnb and. You know, and it's just about being clever about it, but you can get out there into markets and it doesn't have to be as expensive as people think as well. The last thing I wanted to just talk about really is we've talked about, you know, all of these aspects and how to gain the insight and how to go about it. And I hope what I've said has been useful, um, some nuggets of information and, and the things that you can take away and actually start thinking about. One thing I want to say as well is, you know, being clear your side as well, who is going to drive this growth and who's going to gain that market intelligence for you. Um, because it's, you, know, you can gather the data but it needs to be driven, it needs resource behind it. So you do need to think about that and, and think about, okay, is it going to be somebody in-house? Do you have within your existing team and staff people that have the time, the energy, the enthusiasm to go about undertaking some of this work that needs to be done? Um, do they have the right skills as well? Um, if they've not worked internationally before, they may need some support with that. Can you upskill them um, and support them with that? Another option is to obviously outsource some of that work. Um, and there are people, you know, agencies, freelancers that can help you with doing some of this work that you do need to do um, in order to get the intelligence and then find the customers and start obviously entering the marketplace. So, you know, think about that aspect as well. Think about who could do it because it's all very well and good kind of doing the research, doing some analysis, but somebody needs to drive that. Driving it and gaining it, that insight's great, but then who's going to then drive that forward? And the, the continuum of that is that obviously then you will start generating more export customers and there's going to be, you're going to need some internal resource or you're going to need an op option of being able to obviously resource that appropriately to gain what you're looking to get out of um, your overseas expansion and growth plans as well. So, so that's it really from me. Um, like I said, there's some contact de details there that I've put up both for the DIT locally in, in Yorkshire and my own contact details uh, are down there at the bottom. I'm very happy to, to have a conversation with anyone. If anybody wants to get in touch about anything I've said today or any more details, I'm more than happy um, to have a conversation and see if there's anything to do to help as well. So, um, so yes, yeah, so that's it for me. I'll, um, I'll I'll open it up for questions. Really, if anybody's got any questions um, that they want to ask, then then please do. Thank you, Victoria. I hope everyone's found that useful and informative. Um, sound like there's some great things to take away from it. 
Um, as mentioned, we'll now open it up to questions. If, it, if anyone does have any that they'd like to submit, just use the questions pane on your control panel. And as Victoria mentioned, today we're presenting this from the Yorkshire region um, for Department for International Trade. The contact details there on screen, but if you are outside of Yorkshire, you can just go to the www.gov.uk forward slash DIT website and all the relevant contact information is on there for your region. We've got a couple of questions coming in now. Uh, and the first one is, when it comes to gaining initial market information, which sources do you recommend? Okay, yeah. I mean, it, it depends on what industry, obviously, you are, um, you're from. Um, obviously, if, um, if, for example, you're more consumer-facing um, product, then I would always recommend some of the published reports um, that you may get from, from, for example, like Euro Euromonitor, Mintel, etc. And like I say, you can go into the British libraries and access some of that data, um, often for free. I've, as well, I've been told that um, Santander, if you're a member of Santander uh, Business Bank, they have a, a really good trade portal as well, where they give a lot of information, um, again, on markets and, and insight on, on, on sectors as well. Um, so I would say starting out with that and also again approaching, uh, approaching your trade associations and, and your local chambers and asking them um, what they currently have as well and, and looking at, at, at what's available to start with. Great, thank you. Um, Imran asked, is there any way of verifying a recognised authority in a particular territory, i.e. making sure it's not just some bogus company with a governmental sounding name? Okay, yeah, let's have a look. Um, so, so in terms of a recognised authority, I guess you mean from a regulatory point of view and... Um, okay, so I, I'm, taking, I'm taking it that it means from a sort of um, regulation point of view. Yeah, again, I would say that um, ask you, the embassies out in market. Um, what they're quite good at is the people out in market verifying. They can verify a number of things from if you've got a potential distributor that's interested, if there's a potential um, regulatory body or, or somebody that's saying you need to go through us and you're not quite sure, um, you can ask your, look, your embassies in that market sometimes through DIT as well, to just, and they can often do a bit of research. They'll, they'll let you know, do we know who these people are? Um, have we heard of them? Or if not, and, and what I've had sometimes is the embassies have actually then contacted them directly and just, you know, done a bit of vetting um, for, for us and asked and just asked around and said, yeah, okay, these people are legitimate or, or they're not, um, or we haven't heard of them, but we've verified it. So I would say if you've got somebody in mind in a specific market, then um, go out to the embassies there and ask ask the question, and generally they, they, they want to help. So they will generally be able to let you know if they're aware of them, if that's the right information um, or not. Thank you. Um, Alison asked, how do you get market intelligence on the potential distributor, financial stability, et cetera, e.g. currently trying to source distributors in Portugal? So, um, so in terms of market intelligence on the potential distributor, okay, so there are a couple of ways. So if you've got a, a, somebody that's interested um, as a distributor and you're not quite sure, like say, how you want to vet them a bit, um, one of the things I've done in the past is ask them who they currently what other products and brands and principles they deal with already. So they will, if they're a distributor, they'll have a portfolio of products. So within that portfolio, there'll be other brands from other countries and, and other areas that they're selling already. So one of the ways you can verify is by saying, okay, let tell me who else you're dealing with, um, which brands, and, and I would like to take a reference from them. Um, and I've done that with, there was somebody in Indonesia that I wasn't, we had, a, we had a few choices and I wasn't too sure about one so I asked him and he gave me some details of who who he also worked with and I contacted those people and just said look we've been approached by them to work with them um, you know what what are your thoughts um, are they a good are they a good distributor to work with what are what are the positives and the you know the 
with the bad stuff, perhaps, you know, how do they pay on time, you know, whatever is important to you, do they pay on time, you know, do they, do they uh, you know, the sales are, are at a good level for you, etc. whatever it is that you want to kind of find out, think of that in advance, ask if you can find out who they work with, contact those people, um, and, and just verify some of that information so that you feel comfortable with those, with that potential distributor. Um, and another way as well, again, we, I've done this recently out in Dubai, was that we had a potential distributor also interested, um, and I, it was slightly different because we were actually out there and, and, and doing some exhibiting, but I was asking people, oh, have you heard of this company, have you heard of this distributor? And everybody had, and everybody said, yeah, they're a good. Co what What are your thoughts? They're a good company to work with. We said, you know, we know they're, they're well established in the market, etc. And again, that just gives you a bit of confidence. And um, so, being able to find out that information, just ask, asking as many people from different ways as you as you possibly can. Uh, again, the embassy might be able to give you a bit of insight as well if they're known, or could do some verification checks at their side as well. Thank you. A uh, question from Helen who's asked. Any suggestions for making an initial approach to potential target customers for the purpose of gaining market intelligence? And then she followed up with, how do you ask for an appointment, i.e. very busy people and basically want something for them for nothing? Yeah, uh, it's, it, I think when you're approaching people, I always think from a viewpoint, well, what's in it for them? You know, you've got to be able to, so for example, with LinkedIn, like I sort of mentioned about from a messaging point of view, it's about being short and snappy and, and you know, appreciating they may not be the right person, but you're trying to find some information. It's, there's a business opportunity for them. I think you need to position it as, um, you know, you're trying to connect with them, you know, personalizing messaging, you're trying to connect because of X, Y, Z, um, you know, because there's a, there's a potential business opportunity that I would like to, to explore with you and show that you have done some research on, the, on that company as well. I think tailoring and personalizing your messaging. If it's LinkedIn, I always look at the profile of the person I'm, 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 I'm approaching, and if there's any kind of anything I can link to or any sort of connection I can make, you know, is there an expat, where, you know, they're out, they're out in another market and makes, you know, talk about, I'm sure you've got far better weather than, than we have in the UK at the moment, or you can talk about, um, you see any link, maybe they they live near you, uh, where you were, or what university, or and there's some sort of tenuous link. You can always sometimes <laughs> mention that. That that just shows a bit of insight that you've gained through looking at them as a person. When it comes to the company, I do the same. If it's a particular company you're looking at, show that you've done a bit of research, and that you feel that this is you're approaching them specifically because you can you know X Y Z about the company, and as such, you feel there is a uh, a good opportunity. To work together um, and show that you've got some insight on them already um, as a starting point and then once they engage with you you can then ask further questions to gain more insight um, into what it is you're trying to understand um, I would say. Thank you. Uh, one question here, how much desk research should you do before you go and visit a target market? Yeah, it's it's a tough one because you know, like I said, I feel it's it's trying to get a balance between doing enough research so that you are comfortable that you're making the, the right decision with that market, and then you're then at a stage where it's about going out into that market and getting more insight. But at the same time, you you know you, you need enough, but you don't want to. You you can actually then end up spending too long sometimes doing too much research and actually you know, wasting time sometimes where, or, or actually could be more efficient going out into the market and what you can gain in three days, four days being in market versus weeks of doing things from your desk. So it's, I think ultimately it comes down to what you as an individual and your business are comfortable with and everyone's got different thresholds of how, you know, prepared you need to be, how much research you need to have um, to feel comfortable with it. So. It's a personal, it's, I think it's a very personal one, there's no kind of specific, you need to have got to this stage. It's about being comfortable that, okay, we've done enough desk research, we've got enough, um, you know, belief in, in the marketplace there, it's now about going for it, um, and going out into market as the next step. And also, like I say, I think, you know, these days you can get out to market fairly inexpensively, 
Um, the biggest drain, I think, is your time in mean, being out there. But like I say, you could. And actually, I've been out and we've done the desk research. Now, I mentioned in your India earlier. We we went out into India and actually, we ultimately we'd done. We'd had a we'd used the universities. We'd actually then used some own paid for um, services as well for market insight. We went out to the market. We did a trade fair. You know, as well as part of the visit, we sort of tied everything in. And ultimately, we still went away saying, okay, actually, knowing what we know now, we are going to pull back a bit from that market. You know, it was one, we've gained a lot of intelligence and a lot of insight through, through what the process of doing it. But from a business point of view, given what it's going to take to get into that market, we actually pulled back and we focused resources on other areas. And actually, that was the best thing to do. And going out was the best thing we could have done because otherwise we could have spent even longer even more time in, in, you know, at doing desk research and not actually, you know, getting the information we needed. And so sometimes it is going out there to, to be able to then make a decision and, and sometimes that decision is to go back on what you've originally said and done. But that's useful. That's useful because it allows you to then focus your resources and your time into the other areas that will be the, the ones, the bigger, the better opportunities for, for your business and your product longer term. So. Don't be afraid of, of, of taking the leap, I guess, um, because as well, like I say, it, it can be quite um, inexpensive these days. And actually, what's what's more important, what's more valuable, a bit of, a bit of you know, spending a bit of ta a bit of cash on on a, on a project and going out there, or spending a lot longer in house at, at the de at your desk on a, on something that may not be viable for for the business. So, yeah. Thank you, and that's all we've got time for today. Uh, so thank you once again Victoria, for today's presentation, and thank you to the audience for joining us. Uh, yeah, well, thank, thank you very much. It's uh, it's been great, and I hope, like I say, people have found some of what I've said hopefully um, you know of interest, relevant, that you can work work with. And you know, I wish everybody lots of success in their in their exporting adventures. Great, thank you. As you leave, there will be a short survey. Um, pop up on screen if you are able to answer it's just a few questions that really helps us with things going forward and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day thank you thank you bye